Well, on the bench today is this Kenwood uh, TM-D710. It's a FM dual band transceiver. It belongs to my friend Drew. And it's suffering from what we've come to understand is a fairly common problem with these rigs. Uh, the failure of one of the second IF uh, ceramic filters. Now, the symptom for one of these filters going bad is the uh, receiver becoming effectively pretty deaf. And the way I'll demonstrate this is let me turn my RF signal generator on here. And uh, we can see the signal being received on this on this uh, on receiver A, but not on receiver B. And if we turn the volume up here on A, we can hear the one kilohertz tone very clearly without any noise. If I turn up uh, receiver B, there's a lot of noise. And we could tell if I just turn the uh, RF off again and back on. And I'll do the same thing on the A side. So the B side has become effectively uh, pretty deaf. And um, there's actually another way we can verify that uh, what's going on here. Now the second IF actually has two filters associated with each of the, uh, the two sides of the radio, the A and the B side. And those filters are for wide and narrow reception for FM. And usually it's, you know, one of those will go bad first. So we can verify that uh, the B side receiver is still working by switching to the other filter. And so let's go through and change uh, the filter that's being used on the B side here. So I'll switch to the B side. We'll turn my RF signal generator output on and we can see it being received on the A side and nothing on the B. So let's go and change the filter on the B. So instead of the FM mode, let's go to narrowband FM. And uh, if we select that, back out of the menu, I can now see the signal strength here. If we turn the volume up, we can hear that tone from the B side now very clearly. If I switch it back out and use the wideband FM filter, you can hear the noise come back in. And the narrowband filter, we're fine. Now, the root cause of this problem has been narrowed down to at least uh, two different things. One is a, a bit of a design flaw in the way Kenwood implemented the filters. Uh, this is the portion of the schematic here for one of the receivers and these are the two filters here. There's a pair of switching diodes on either side to switch between the high and the low or the narrow and the wide path. And uh, the problem is is that these ceramic filters uh, aren't designed to have any DC bias at any of the ports. And uh, the, the way that this design is implemented when these switching diodes are switched on to turn and enable one of the filters, the DC bias of the switching diode appears at the input and the output of these filters. And that can lead to problems in these ceramic filters. One of those problems uh, could be electromigration. Now, electromigration is a growth of, of conductor material within the devices, particularly if there's moisture present or contaminants. And that's the other problem. We found that uh, I don't know if it's a particular run of these uh, radios or a particular run of the filters have had a moisture or contamination problem uh, within the, and around the filters and even inside the cavities of the filters. There's a ham uh, uh, Sugar Victor 8 Yankee mic, SV8YM, that's documented this problem pretty clearly on his blog. And I'll, I'll include links to, to his blog and some of his pictures and explanations in the uh, video notes below. But when I open the radio up, I'll show you this in a moment, there was evidence of some moisture contamination and like a salty crystalline growth around these filters. So that coupled with the DC bias problem uh, really is what led to the failure of one of these filters and probably the ultimate demise of all of them until we do some repair. So let's take a look inside the radio and I'll show you the contamination. Hopefully it will show up well enough on camera. I'm taking the uh, screws out of the, the lid here. And if we take a close look in here uh, here are the four filters here. And if you look carefully, you may be able to see kind of a white, uh, light-colored, you know, kind of a salty-looking uh, contamination on the filters. And I kind of wiped it a little bit off on this filter back here with my finger, but it certainly indicates there's some kind of contamination. And that kind of, uh, you know, crystalline contamination is most likely inside the filter as well. 
and it's one of these four filters that has failed and uh, the other ones are likely to follow at some point. Of course simply replacing the filters with some new ones will solve the problem but ultimately we may run into seeing this problem again if we don't repair the, uh, the DC bias problem, the design issue. And the way to deal with that is uh, what we need to do is insert capacitors in series with the input and output of each of these uh, filters. So there are two filters uh, for each of the two bands, so there's four filters that we need to deal with, thus eight capacitors we need to put in place. And uh, Tassos, uh on his uh, blog, SV8YM, um, had a couple of really nice detailed pictures of how he repaired a radio and solved the design problem. And we'll likely do something similar here when we go to replace these filters. Okay, so in order to do the repair, we need to pull this board out so we can get to the bottom of the board to unsolder these filters and see what we can do to insert capacitors in series with the inputs and outputs. So that's going to involve removing the speak, uh, speaker support bracket here, uh, remove this ribbon cable, which is done by lifting up on these black tabs on either side and pulling that ribbon cable out, pulling these couple of plugs, unscrewing all of the screws that hold the circuit board down, as well as uh, the screw back here for the voltage regulator, and there are four screws underneath that hold the RF power amplifier modules to the chassis. Since they're soldered to this board, it's easier to just remove those four screws and pull everything out as an assembly. And we'll also have to unsolder the uh, PL259 connector uh, on the back here. And then we'll be able to pull the board out and remove these filters, replace them, and deal with inserting those capacitors. Okay, so I've removed the, uh, the speaker bracket and the speaker and the plugs that we're plugging that in. Uh, to pull out this ribbon cable, we just need to lift up on these two plastic tabs on the end here. Might be easier with a, a fingernail there and a fingernail here. And with those tabs lifted up, this ribbon cable will slide right out. We can get that up and out of the way. Just need to remove uh, the screw here for the uh, voltage regulator. These four screws down here for the uh, PA modules and then this plug for uh, the fan and then unsolder RPL259. And you've got to use extreme caution in pulling all these screws out. There's an awful lot of very small surface mount components that will be very easily damaged if you slip with the screwdriver. So I've got all the screws pulled out, the screws pulled out of the power modules, and the voltage regulator, so everything, the board should be loose, and we can now lift it out of the case very carefully. Okay, and flip it over and see what we're dealing with. So the, uh, the filters that we're going to be dealing with are right down in this area here. And uh, we'll start off by uh, removing the filters that are in place. Now all four of these filters look identical, uh, but they are each one of them is different. Uh, two of them are centered at 455, two are centered at 450 kilohertz, and then one is wide, one is narrow. There's a very small difference in the part numbers on each of them. So what I did is I just drew myself a picture of where each of these are. So when I pull them all out, I can put the new ones back in the right place without mixing them up. As this is a through hole part, we can use the uh, vacuum desoldering tool to remove the solder from the holes and the leads simultaneously. In order to uh, isolate the inputs and outputs of the filter, we need to make some cuts in the circuit board. So just as an example, here's where the ground connections are for one of the filters and the input and output. So you can see, I've, uh, you might be able to see carefully, I've used this little hook knife to make a very small cut in the uh, trace here and here as well on one side and then here and here on the other side. And then what we'll be doing is installing a very small wire from the switching diode here to uh, the other end of the circuit at this point, bringing that across you know, in the air, and then attaching a ACLE coupling capacitor, a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, from the uh, filter node up to that wire. So essentially we're completing the circuit uh, in air with a piece of wire, and then AC coupling to that connection, and we'll do that on all four filters. Right, so now that uh, all 16 cuts have been made in the board on the A and the B receivers, 
we can reinstall the filters and then put in the capacitors and jumper wires. So each of the filters are labeled on the board. You can see this last remaining spot is labeled 50G and if we look at the, the filter the part number's got uh, 50G in there as well. You know, sometimes I find it easier to solder these kind of standing up uh, with the board standing up because then I can put one finger behind the board to hold the part in place and get one lead tacked in place. And with that one lead in place then we can go through more carefully solder the remaining leads. Now, soldering these capacitors standing up on the, uh, the ends of the filter pins uh, is a little tricky. But I start with a little solder on the end of the capacitor and then reflow the pad and drop the capacitor into it. And uh, do that for all eight capacitors we need to install. Now, to make the little wire bridges, I'll start off by putting a little pool of solder on the top of uh, one of the capacitors. And then I'll take some uh, wire wrap wire, nice 30 gauge uh, wire, and uh, let that sit into the pool of solder on top of the capacitor. And then uh, we'll clip off each end of that and dress that down to make the connections to bridge the, uh, the cuts that we put in the circuit board. Alrighty, well that uh, tedious bit of soldering is done. Uh, we've got all four bridge wires on that are now connecting, reconnecting the cuts that were made in the circuit board but now I've got the series capacitors in place on either side of the ceramic filters. So that should take care of the repair. Uh, as I went through the repair I verified that I had uh, good connection through to the 10k resistors on this side here and good connections to the uh, diodes themselves by measuring uh, through the diode drop. So I know that uh, everything is connected and nothing is shorted to ground or to each other. So we're ready to put the board back into the radio and give it a go. Alrighty, here we go. Moment of truth. Everything is back together. Let's turn the radio on. Okay, it's booting up and we see the radio is tuned to uh, same frequency on both A and B. And turn the RF output on and I can see that output being received on both bands. So uh, let's make sure that uh, it, now this is a wideband FM and wideband FM. So first listening to band, uh, band A, uh, that signal sounds good. Let's switch that to uh, the narrowband FM. Okay, select that. Now it's on narrowband. And we're getting a signal and it sounds nice. So let's switch that back to FM. And now switch over to band B, listen to that one. That sounds good, not noisy anymore. And let's switch that to narrow band. Select that. And that sounds good as well, not noisy. So it looks like we fixed the problem. And it was a certainly a little tricky with the uh, uh, standing up the uh, surface mount capacitors and wiring over and making those delicate delicate cuts in the circuit board but uh, this way we've rep repaired the, uh, the faulty filters and also taken care of the design flaw that was putting the DC bias on those filters that may have accelerated their demise. So special thanks out to uh, SV8YM, uh, Tassos I believe his name is, a ham out in Greece that had some really detailed pages on his blog and again I'll link those below that described how to do this repair and it looked like it worked out great on uh, my friend Drew's uh, TMD uh, 710. Thanks again for watching I hope you enjoyed.